स्क्रीन नाउ यस मैम आपकी स्क्रीन नजर आ रही है स्टूडेंट जो है वो म्यूट है हेलो मैम आपकी स्क्रीन नजर आ रही है स्टूडेंट जो है वो म्यूट है वो आपको चैट में बता देंगे कि स्क्रीन नजर आ रही है ओके सो आई एम स्टार्टिंग माय प्रेजेंटेशन ऑन प्राइमरी ए मिनोरियो आई एम प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर जहारा हसन I'm sorry for the delay because there was some technical problem. So uh, the topic of today's lecture is primary amenorrhea. The contents of this lecture is uh, the lecture includes the definition of primary amenorrhea, its pathophysiology, the secondary sexual characteristics. What are actually the secondary sexual characteristics? The classification, evaluation, and management. so coming over to the definition of primary amenorrhea primary amenorrhea is defined as menstruation which has not been started by the age of 14 in the absence of secondary sexual characteristics so that's actually the uh, second that's actually called primary amenorrhea it is when the section secondary sexual characteristics are not developed or not found menstruation has not occurred by the age of 16 even if the secondary sexual characteristics is present so you can define primary amenorrhea on two bases that is that is there is absence of onset of menstruation by the age of 14 if their secondary sexual characteristics are not formed and the second definition is when menstruation has not occurred by the age of 16 even if the secondary sexual characteristics are formed so what is the pathophysiology of primary amenorrhea why does this primary amenorrhea occurs why does this girl doesn't have a start of onset of menstruation it may be some problem in the hypothalamus or there may be problem in the pituitary or in the ovary or in the uterus because the uh, circuit starts off with hypothalamus is a trigger at puberty when the hypothalamus starts producing the gonadotropin releasing hormones these gonadotropin releasing hormones in turn act on the pituitary gland to produce follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone these act on the ovary to produce or cause the growth of the ovarian follicles these ovarian follicles in turn produce estrogen and at four, day 14 around day 14 in the mid cycle when ovulation occurs then the corpus luteum is formed and progesterone is produced both of these hormones the estrogen and the progesterone act on the uterus to cause development of the endometrium at ovulation the progesterone starts formed from the corpus luteum and if pregnancy has not occurred there will be shedding of endometrium at around day 28 to day 30 when menstruation appears so this is a cycle and this is a circuit which is being followed in every woman starting from hypothalamus acting on pituitary then in the ovary and the last receptor organ is the uterus so what happens actually in primary amenorrhea if the lesion is in the hypothalamus there is no gnrh that is there is no gonadotropin releasing hormone signaling to the pituitary and in return the pituitary doesn't respond so there will be no production of fsh and lh or there will be very low production of fsh and lh to act on the ovary or the reproductive tract and so there will be no menstruation so that's how a hypothalamic lesion affects the reproductive tract in causing amenorrhea now how a pituitary lesion affects if there's a lesion in the pituitary or there's a cause in the pituitary gland there will be no fsh or lh to act on ovary there will be no harm ovarian hormones to act on uterus and there will be no menstruation how does a ovarian lesion acts there is no estrogen no progesterone to act on the uterus and thus there will be no menstruation similarly if there is a lesion in the uterus that is if the uterus is not properly formed as in the Uh, there's there's a syndrome in which there's hypo uh, uh, plastic uterus or is a absent uterus there will be no menstruation
Now, coming over to the secondary sexual characteristics. Just give me two, three minutes so I could check. Is there any questions in chat or not? Coming over to the secondary sexual characteristics. What happens in the secondary sexual characteristics actually? There is a growth spurt. The growth spurt is because of the insulin like growth factor one. There is breast development, which requires estrogen. Breast development starts about two to three years before the onset of menstruation. And when the breast part starts to appear, the, uh, the uh, process is called thalarchy. Then next is adrenarchy. That is the pubic and the axillary growth uh, hairs start to grow. And then there is menarche. So number one, in a girl, number one, the, the first secondary sexual characteristic is the growth spurt. Immediately at around age of 10, 11, 12, the girls grow. And this requires the insulin-like growth factor one. And the height increases, the body mass increases. Then there's breast development, which is called thalarchy. Then there's pubic and axillary hair growth, which is called adrenarchy, which requires androgens. And then there's onset of menstruation, which is called menarche. So please remember these terms, thalarchy, adrenarchy, and menarche. These are words. These are the four secondary sexual characteristics that should be observed. Then, with the secondary sexual characteristics as the pubic and the axillary hairs grow, there is change in the genitalia also. That is, the genitals starts to grow. You can see in this pectoral diagram, that is, in males, how the genital tract or the genital organs grow, and see how the breast development occurs and the pubic hairs grow in a female. It's a tanner stage which is being utilized to assess the growth. Little growth in stage one and full growth in stage five. So in stage five, you can see See the full grown pubic hairs, which is in a normal female. Now, how do you classify primary amenorrhea? Primary amenorrhea is classified on the basis of presence or absence of secondary sexual characteristics. So we divide primary amenorrhea as the, with presence of secondary sexual characteristics and with absence of secondary sexual characteristics. And now you know there are four secondary sexual characteristics, that is the growth spurt, development of breast, development of pubic and axillary hairs, and the onset of menses, or menarche. This is a very concise table in which you can see the causes. There are so many causes. The secondary sexual characteristics are normal in conditions like imperforate hymen, and the hymen is intact, which is a cause of cryptomenorrhea, that is hidden menstruation. There may be a transverse vaginal septum. There may be absent vagina and a functioning uterus. There may be absent vagina and non-functioning uterus. There may be androgen insensitivity in which XY female is there. There may be resistant ovary syndrome, or there may be a constitutional delay. In all these conditions, the secondary sexual characteristics are normally formed, and even then, the girl doesn't have uh, onset of menstruation. Now, conditions in which the secondary sexual characteristics are absent. Girls having a normal stature, which is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. What do you mean actually by hypogonadotropic hypogonadism? As the name suggests, hypogonadotropic. If that is something related to the gonadotropin hormones. 
something related to the gonadotropin hormones. That is, the hormones, gonadotropin harm, releasing hormone is not being properly formed from the hypothalamus. That is, there is congenital isolated GnRH deficiency, or there may be a syndrome which is called as the olfactory genital syndrome. Or this absence of production of GnRH may be associated with certain acquired conditions like excessive weight loss like anorexia nervosa. Girls don't eat, they don't have adequate weight gain, and their hypothalamus do not function properly to produce a gonadotropin releasing hormone. There may be hyperprolactinemia, which may be associated with absence secondary sexual characteristics because of GnRH deficiency. Then other causes are like hypergonadotropic hypergonadism, conditions in which there are more gonadotropins. These are conditions in which there's some abnormality in the chromosomes, that is 46XX or 46XY, some chromosomal abnormalities. They may be gonadoagenesis. It may be excess agenesis, it may be XY agenesis or it may be Turner syndrome or Turner mosaics. In these conditions, the girl may have a normal stature, but there's some mosaicism or some abnormality. And this all results in ovarian failure. All results in ovarian failure. That is, there's partial production of estrogen and no progesterone and partial production of estrogen only. And there is gonadotropin deficiency. All these women usually have a normal stature, but with this normal stature, amenorrhea occurs. And the secondary sexual characteristics are absent because of lack of availability of estrogen and progesterone. Or estrogen may be only minimally present for the second, secondary sexual characteristics to appear at a borderline level. Now, then there are patients who have a short stature. That is, the first stage of growth spurt was even absent. In those patients who have a normal stature, growth spurt up years, but the secondary sexual characteristics like the pelarchy and menarchy and adrenarchy doesn't appear. In girls with short stature, even the first stage of growth spurt doesn't appear. In these conditions, they are more severe. That is, the gonadotropins are almost altogether absent. Conditions include trauma to the uh, brain, empty cell syndrome, certain tumors which affect the hypothalamus, resulting in damage to the hypothalamus and so no gonadotropin production. So these are the causes of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Then there are conditions which are hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, in which the gonadotropin hormones are more, but the ovaries are resistant. The ovaries are not functioning, as occurs in Turner syndromes or sex syndrome dysgenesis, another Turner mosaics. Then amenorrhea may also occur in heterosexual development in which is abnormal 46XX dysgenesis and 46XY dysgenesis. And then there may be two hermaphrodites. Now, the commonest cause of amenorrhea with normal secondary sexual characteristics is imperforate hymen. What happens actually? The hymenal membranes fail to rupture. And initially, there's a mucosal as the mucus is secreted by the vagina before the onset of menstruation. And once menstruation has started, there is, there'll be hematocolpus. Hematocolpus means the vagina full of blood and it doesn't come out. Once the vagina gets filled, then the uterus gets filled, which is called hematometra. That is, blood accumulates within the uterine cavity. There may be conditions of hidden in, uh, menstruation, which is also known as cryptomenorrhea, which is called a transvaginal septum. 
In this condition, the vagina fails to cannulate. The upper and the lower part of the vagina are separate. And there's a septum at the, which may occur at the three levels. Either it's in the upper level, upper one third, in the middle one third, or in the lower one third. The condition is usually diagnosed on vaginal examination. When you found, when the examining, examiner found a, sec, a transverse septum in the vagina and the vagina is non canonized The clinical presentation of this cryptoamenorrhea with transverse vaginal septums and imperforate hymen is usually cyclical abdominal pains. A mass may be palpable for abdominally, which is hematocolpus or hematometra. And the vagina may be blind ending, or there may be complete membrane at the enteritis which is obstructing the vagina. It may produce a pinkish or a blue discoloration because of the blood at the back of this membrane, which is I'm, I'm, uh, imperforate hymen. Then there will be absent vagina in a functioning uterus. That is the vagina is absent, but the uterus is functioning. And there'll be a matometra. The treatment of all these conditions is reconstructive surgery. In imperforate hymen, resect the hymen so that the uh, pathway becomes patent. If there's a vaginal septum, resection of the vaginal septum will, uh, opate, will keep the outflow tract open and patent. That is opening of the outflow tract. And then the menstrual blood starts draining. It's a condition which is known as meyer okitansky kusner hofer syndrome. In this kusner hauser syndrome, there is a classical picture of primary amenorrhea. It's a very common condition. On examination, there's usually a blind ending with vaginal dimple, and there is absence of uterus and the fallopian tubes. It is associated in 40% of the cases with renal abnormalities and skeletal abnormalities. So it's the second commonest cause of primary amenorrhea that is an absent uterus, a dimpling of the vagina, and it may be just a uterine remnant or no uterus at all. It's diagnosed on clinical examination, confirmed on MRI examination, and the treatment is again reconstructive surgery in which you do a vaginoplasty. Then the other cause is a 46XY karyotype and a female phenotype. This is androgen insensitivity. It's a male karyotype, that is an XY karyotype, but the, because of the androgen insensitivity or absence or failure of function of the androgen receptors at the end organs, that is at the pubic hair level, the female is the person is grown like a female phenotype because the end receptor organs for the androgens are absent. The condition is also known as androgen insensitivity or testicular feminization. There is normal breast development. The pubic hairs are very strong, uh, scanty. The vulva is normal and the vagina is usually short, but there's no uterus. Then is the resistant ovary syndrome. An absence or malfunction of FSH receptors in the ovarian follicles usually resist, result in resistant ovary syndrome. The ovary doesn't have the receptors for the follicle stimulating hormone, and so the ovarian follicles doesn't form. And this thus results in absence of production of estrogen and progesterone, and primary amenorrhea occurs. The commonest cause of primary amenorrhea, which the uh, girls or the female comes and refers to, is the constitutional delay. There's a normal anatomy and all endocrine investigations are normal. And the sole reason is the immature, uh, the immature system and the immature pulsatile release of GnRH from the hypothalamus. Usually around 16 years of age in a woman with normally developed secondary sexual characteristics, menstruation usually starts spontaneously. Now, coming over to the other uh, 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 condition of absent secondary sexual characteristics. Normal stature. With normal stature, 
hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. It may be congenital. That is, there is isolated GnRH deficiency. The hypothalamus lacks the ability to produce GnRH due to maldevelopment of neurons in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. Then there will be another condition which is known as Kalman syndrome in which there's maldevelopment of neurons with anosmia. That is, the neurons which are derived from the olfactory bulb are also absent. Then there will be acquired conditions. That is, with normal stature, there will be hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. That is, there is isolated GnRH deficiency or there will be acquired conditions like weight loss. With weight loss anorexia, what happens actually this lack of failure of initiation of puberty. This is mainly because the functionality of the hypothalamus becomes suppressed and the normal hormones fluctuate that regulate the menstrual cycle. Girls who do excessive exercise like athletes also have slow or they stop the release of production of natropin from the hypothalamus. And they usually also suffer from acquired causes of GnRH deficiency, and amenorrhea. Hyperprolactinemia is another cause of amenorrhea, and this may be associated with pituitary tumors, like a micro or a macro adenoma of the pituitary gland. Then comes the hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, that is, in which there's more production of gonadotropins. It is actually the lack or inhibition of the negative feedback what happens actually is gonadal agenesis. Either the gonads are not properly functioning, for example, in the Turner syndrome, or the, it's an abnormal chromosomal pattern like 46 excess with pure gonadal agenesis or a mosaicism or a Turner's mosaicism or a Turner syndrome. It is gonadal agenesis. And when there's gonadal agenesis, the pituitary doesn't recognize that the ovaries are not functioning. So in order to let the ovaries trigger and cause of ovarian follicle function, more and more conatropins are produced by the hypothalamus. And so there will be increased levels of FSH and LH. Then gonadal dysgenesis, in which the ovaries are abnormal. And then there'll be ovarian failure. They may be secondary to chemotherapy or radiotherapy for childhood malignancy, they may be acquired because of certain autoantibodies production. Certain enzymatic deficiencies like galactosemia will also result in ovarian cellular destruction and cause ovarian failure. Now coming over to the other cause like short stature. Hypogonadotropic hypogonadism may be congenital. For example, if the girl has hydrocephalus, the gene actually secreting neurons are not functioning properly. It may be acquired secondary to trauma to the skull bone that is damaged to the hypothalamus. Or it may be an empty cell syndrome, congenital absence of the pituitary gland or at least part of it. Most common cause is the craniopharyngiomas or the tumors of the pituitary gland. It arises in childhood and results in destruction of the pituitary gland. Then is the Turner syndrome. Then there are heterosexual development with abnormal dysgenesis, like congenital adrenal hyperplasia. There is more and more androgens in the body, which results in abnormal secondary sexual characteristics. There may be androgen secreting tumors. There may be absent mullerian inhibitor factor which result in absence of secondary sexual characteristics. There may be 5-alpha reductase deficiency, which may result in prevention of conversion of testosterone to 5-hydroxy testosterone. Then there may be partial androgen deficiency. Then there are true homophrodites, in which both testicular and ovarian tissues are present. They are the true intersex. And there is primary amenorrhea. Now, after this long, difficult definition and classification of primary amenorrhea, we'll come over to evaluation and management, how to evaluate. 
first of all, establish the diagnosis. If there, there may be a constitutional delay, the first thing which you're going to do is for a history and physical examination. First of all, see that section, secondary sexual characteristics are developed or absent. This is the first thing which you're going to see in a woman with primary amenorrhea. The second investigation required is ultrasound pelvis. See if the uterus is present or absent. If the uterus is absent or abnormal like streak, go for a karyotype. If it's 46 XX with the absent uterus, it may be mere rokitansky kusner horsley syndrome. If it's 46 XY karyotype, then it may be testicular. It may be androgen insensitivity. Or they, there is testicle development and you have to search where are the testicles. Or there may be some enzymatic failure in the testes. This is the most important slide which you have to remember. That is, first of all, assess. In a patient with primary amenorrhea, check for the presence of secondary sexual characteristics, whether they are present or they are not present. If they are present, go for the ultrasound. Uterus present, uterus absent. Uterus absent, karyotype, 46 xx near rocket tanks, 46 xy androgen insensitivity. Uterus present, exclude outward tract obstruction, imperforate hymen, vaginal septum, cervical stenosis. Okay. If there's no outward tract obstruction, evaluate for secondary amenorrhea. That is, if the uterus is present and the outro tract is patent, give this patient a progesterone challenge test. Give her progesterone and see whether there's withdrawal bleed or not. If there's no withdrawal bleed, then check the estrogen levels. Are the ovaries resistant or not? If there is withdrawal bleed, then it may evaluate for the causes of secondary amenorrhea. If the secondary sexual characteristics are absent, then the next step is to check the height of the patient. Is the girl of normal height or of a short height? Check their uh, gonadotropin levels. If the GNR gonadotropin levels, that is FSH and LH levels are low, it is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. If the FSH and LH levels are high, it is hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. Then comes patients with normal height. Again, check their gonadotropin levels. Again, classify them into hypogonadotropic or hypergonadotropic. In hypogonadotropic patients, go for CT scan or MRI of the brain to exclude for the presence of tumor. If there's tumor like hyperprolactinomas, give bromocryptine. If there's no tumor, check for the cause. It's acquired like weight loss, anorexia nervosa, or excess exercise, or it's congenital like gonadal dysgenesis, galactosemia, or ovarian failure, or it may be an isolated genealogy defici uh, deficiency. In these patients with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and no tumor is being found, the only treatment is to give hormone replacement therapy. Girls with Hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. That is, if the gonadotropin levels are very high, check for the karyotype. If it's a normal karyotype, that is 46XX, they may be having premature ovarian failure or a resistant ovary or a gonadal dysgenesis or agenesis. If it's 46XY, it's testicular feminization or it may be gonadal agenesis. Now, coming over to the third category of short height. Check for the gonadotropin levels again. It again may be hypogonadotropic or hypergonadotropic. In hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, check for imaging of CNS, empty cell or craniopharyngiomas. If high hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, check for the karyotype. Like it may be Turner syndrome, a 45XO. The treatment is again hormone replacement therapy. And you have to give them hormone replacement therapy to induce puberty, to 
in order to assess for the presence of secondary sexual characteristics. So now I will look at the chart. Okay. Are there any questions? Uh, okay, the question is in investigation, why we give progesterone first? Uh, actually, if the secondary sexual characteristics are there and the- uh, Ma'am, screen is not Yes, but now? Ma'am, screen is not Screen, just share with me. No, ma'am. Are you talking No, ma'am. Okay, screen, I have shared one card, the lecture has been finished. Okay, ma'am, okay, ma'am. Okay. Now, I'll give you the answers to the questions. Okay. Uh, why we give progesterone first? Like, if we have excluded all the causes, like, if there is no outflow tract obstruction, the FSH and LH levels are normal. Uh, and the secondary sexual characteristics are also normal. And even the patient is not menstruating, then we have to give progesterone first in order to assess that she has excessive and, uh, estrogen, which is acting on the uh, uterus or not. So in that condition, we give progesterone. We give progesterone as primary 10, five milligrams, three times a day to check for withdrawal. If the patient has withdrawal, it means she has excessive estrogen Reduced from the ovary, but she's anovulating. That's why she has amenorrhea. So the first test uh, which we give is the progesterone challenge test. And if she's not responding to progesterone, then we go on to the next diagnosis. For the Rokitansky syndrome, Rokitansky syndrome is a condition in which there is, it's also known as, in easy words, Mullerian agenesis. The mullerian ducts or the paramesonephric ducts have never functioned properly, have never formed properly. And as the paramesonephric ducts are responsible for the production of fallopian tubes and the uterus and the upper part of the vagina, because of their agenesis, there is absence of uterus, the vagina, and the fallopian tubes. And so whatever you do, the patient is not going to menstruate. Although she has normal FSH, normal LH levels, normal uh, uh, levels of estrogen and maybe progesterone because she may be ovulating, but she has an absent uterus. So she's not going to menstruate. The next question is in androgen resistance when the karyotype is 46 XY and the external genitalia and internal genitalia of a female. It's the, the, the external and the internal genitalia. There will be no internal genitalia, but the external genitalia will be of a female because it's actually a 46 XY. The malarian inhibitory factor is going to be there in the male. The, external, the, the internal genitals will not be there, but the external genitals, the breast development, the thalarchy will be there. There will be thalarchy, there will be growth spot, but there will be no menstruation. But the external genitalia will be like a female. Do we investigate for secondary amenorrhea when there is no obstruction of the tract? Yes. The next step is always to exclude for secondary amenorrhea. And to investigate for secondary amenorrhea, the first test which we are going to do is the progesterone challenge test, which is going to a progesterone after actually after a progesterone challenge test, when you give progesterone to the patient, it means she has estrogens in her body. And if she has a withdrawal, it, it's going to indicate she has a patent genital tract. It's a, she has a functioning uterus, actually. So that's how we investigate for secondary amenorrhea. 
So if a patient comes to you, she has a normal sec secondary sexual characteristics, she has a patent genital tract, and she, has, she appears normal, and then she has primary amenorrhea. Number one, it may be constitutional delay. The second test which you're going to do is go for an ultrasound. The ultrasound is going to tell you that there's a uterus is present and, uh, and you examine for a patent genital tract. Then the second test which you're going to do is go give her progesterone to see whether she has a withdrawal or not. If she doesn't have a withdrawal, then go for other tests. Then check for the gonadotropin first. Any other question? I can understand primary amenorrhea is a very difficult and a confusing topic. I've tried to make it very simple and concise, but if this lecture is recorded, then please go through, go through it again. It's a very simple, uh, I've, I've, I've tried to make it very simplified according to the, um, the classification, which is easy and a clinical classification. So uh, I can understand it's a very difficult topic, especially for undergrads, but you just need to know the major problems which are associated with uh, primary amenorrhea. So if there are no more questions, then uh, I think we should uh, finish off the lecture then. Thank you then, thank you so much.